thank you for coming out. It's a, not a great night, I know. And welcome to all of you. I'm Carol Becker, Dean of the School of the Arts um, at Columbia University. And I'd like to thank first the World Leaders Forum, the Office of the President, the Maison Francaise for sponsoring this event along with us at the School of the Arts. And I especially really want to thank Shani Peer, a scholar of French history, author, and the director of the Maison Francaise for inviting me to open this session. It's great to be participating. It is my complete pleasure to introduce our two fantastic guests, guests tonight. Antonin Baudry, cultural counselor for France in the United States, and Rocco Landsman, chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts. Last week, Rocco Landsman confirmed that he will be stepping down as chairman of the NEA. He seems very happy about this. <laughs> we are really honored that this is his absolutely last public appearance in this capacity with us here tonight. So we're very, very proud. I'll begin my introductions with Monsieur Baudry. In September of 2010, Antonin Baudry was appointed cultural counselor for France and permanent representative for French universities in the United States. He has been trained as both a civil engineer and a literary scholar. I thought that was really very interesting and very unique. Leaving the Ecole Polytechnique to study literature at the Ecole Normale Supérieure, where Columbia's Antoine Compagnon was one of his favorite professors. Mr. Baudry held several positions in French government ministries before being appointed cultural counselor for the French embassy in Spain in 2006, and then taking up his current position in New York in 2010. Mr. Baudry leads the cultural services of the French Embassy in the United States, whose nationwide mission is to enrich the partnerships between France and the United States in the economic, political, and cultural spheres through educational and cultural initiatives. He has been a great supporter of French-American exchange at Columbia through the Maison Francaise, but also with the Alliance program. University partnerships are one of his key priorities, so welcome to Columbia. Rocco Landsman was named by President Obama and confirmed by the U.S. Senate as the 10th Chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, the NEA, in August 2009. He attended Colby College and the University of Wisconsin-Madison and he earned a doctorate in dramatic literature at the Yale School of Drama, where he also taught for several years. He then briefly ran a private investment fund before, in 1987, becoming president of Drew Jamson, a company that owns and operates five Broadway theaters. Mr. Landsman produced Broadway shows such as Big River, which won a Tony Award for Best Musical, Angels in America, Millennium Approaches, which won a Tony Award for Best Play, and I would say changed the world and our whole thinking about theater. Angels in America, Perestroika, which also won a Tony the following year for Best Play, and the producers that won a Tony Award for Best Musical in 2001. Not surprisingly, under Rocco Landsman's leadership, the NEA has become much more collaborative and, and entrepreneurial. He has worked hard to help people understand that, as one of the agency's motto says, art works. And it works at many levels. As his Our Town program demonstrates, art improves economic growth and community development. Under his leadership, the NEA also started Art Place to integrate artists into local efforts in housing, transportation, economic, and urban development. He has been one of the most exciting directors of the NEA that any of us can remember, and I think we're going to miss him in this role. So it is a unique opportunity to have these two prominent cultural leaders with us in conversation, moderated by Shani Peer, who understands the place of art in both cultures so well. In terms of art production, the relationship between the U.S. and France has always been rather intense. American artists and art persons have often felt jealous of the place of art and artist in France. We have believed deeply, whether well-founded or very romantic, that the French really love art and that its importance need not be defended to the society. And we have believed that its esteemed position has been reflected in the amount of resources provided to French artists and cultural institutions by the government. Such support has not always been the case in the US that by nature is very utilitarian and hasn't always understood the need for art in society to enliven the spirit, help provoke civic debate, embolden democracy, not to mention drive the economy. And although the US has been the source of enormous cultural production, enviable in its diversity and excitement, 
Many artists, writers, musicians have left the US for France at different historical times in the hope of being better understood. James Baldwin, Ernest Hemingway, Gertrude Stein, Miles Davis, and even Edgar Allan Poe were initially more appreciated in France than in the US. Also in the last decades, US artists have found great assistance in Europe's investment in the arts that has enabled them to be in residence to produce work, premiere new pieces in Europe. Both societies have benefited from these collaborations and productions, but as money in Europe for the arts becomes more scarce, it will directly affect what work will be brought back and shown in the US, altering many of these historical dynamics. Contemporary French artists, on the other hand, have often admired and taken inspiration from the irreverence of US artists to tradition, the risks they have been willing to take, their innovations in form, engagement in community projects, and the degree to which America's diversity is reflected in its artistic production. Also, increasingly, Europe is looking more to the model of private philanthropy, which is so well developed in the US. So there is a great deal to discuss. We welcome both fascinating leaders to Columbia. We look forward to the conversation. Shani Peer will lead them in. And we're also very fortunate tonight to have George Lewis as our respondent. He is an artist, musician, composer, writer, theorist, and the Edwin H. Case Professor of American Music at Columbia. He's also spent quite a bit of time in France working as an artist. So let's begin. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like, to, I'd like to join Carol in thanking our co-sponsors, the World Leaders Forum and School of the Arts for co-sponsoring this event tonight with the Maison Française. Um, and I'd like to thank Carol for her thoughtful introduction and George for agreeing to be a respondent. It's, one, it's great to have such wonderful colleagues here at Columbia. Um, I also want to thank Debbie Landisman and Jamie Bennett for making this event possible tonight. Um, Jamie actually was, is Chief of Staff for Rocco and was Chief of Staff for President Bollinger at Columbia before, before going to Washington. So I want to thank them for making this event possible. It's really a very special event because when I came to Columbia a little over three years ago, I, had, I first had the idea and it was one of the first things I wanted to do was to invite Rocco here for a dialogue about arts policies in France and the United States. So it's really an extraordinary privilege to have this be his last, um, last public event as chairman before stepping down. And it's doubly an honor to have Antonin Baudry. Antonin is a wonderful um, ambassador for French-American exchange in the cultural field and in higher education. Um, and he's a great friend of Colombia, a great supporter of the Maison Française, um, and, a, and a friend. So it's really wonderful to have both of them here tonight for this discussion about arts policies in France and the United States. Um, I'd like to just start by kind of laying the, the groundwork and asking each of you to sketch for us in, in rather broad terms what role the state plays in supporting the arts in your country. Um, how does it support both at the federal level and the local level, artists, art institutions? What kind of financing does it provide? Um, how does it encourage public access to, to the arts? Um, and also maybe what some of the priorities are today in terms of cultural policy and arts policies. So maybe we'll start with Rocco. Uh, thanks, Shani. Um, I saw that you're introduced as Shani Peer. You're Shani Landisman to me. <laughs> and um, uh, Shani's married to my brother Cliff, and it's kind of family night for me here <laughs> because uh, not only Debbie, but um, North and Nash and Dodge, my sons are here, and Knight, my brother. Uh, so I'm feeling very much at home and among family uh, here tonight. It's a, it's a good feeling on my and last Cliff official occasion. Cliff is coming somewhere. My son Chance is there and Mira oh, is, is on Cliff here so too? It's really, it's a Landisman event. Okay, <laughs> it, it, it really, <laughs> more Landisman than, than anything, right. Um, and how you finally put this together and arranged all the different moving pieces to make this happen, I don't know. You've been determined to do this <laughs> for a long time and, and here we are, so well done. Um, it's great to be here. Um, well, I don't know why um, Antonin is even sitting here with me uh, <laughs> tonight. When you look at our relative uh, positions uh, and the relative positions of our, of our two countries, um, there is really no comparison in terms of what public expenditure of the arts uh, 
is. I, as I said to him on the phone the other day, uh, you know, I have tremendous culture envy uh, mm -hmm. as I look at what happens in, in, in Europe and especially uh, France. The uh, budget for the National Endowment for the Arts is about, uh, give or take a couple of million, $150 million. Uh, and uh, I don't know how the euros exactly translate, but it's probably close to $9 billion in, um, in France. That's a little different. And it would be pretty remarkable if the countries had the same populations. Um, so uh, I don't know how to characterize our um, arts budget. Uh, the word I generally use, and every time I use this word, I get a memo from the, from, uh, the, from the White House. Uh, the word I generally use is pathetic. Um, but they tell me I'm not supposed to say that. So, uh, but one more time before I leave, it's pathetic. <laughs> um, now, um, how we, and, and even the money is not directly appropriated. By law, we're, we're not allowed, except in certain exceptions, at, at literature and a couple of others, uh, to give money directly to artists. We have to give money to um, uh, institutions that then turn around and give it to artists. And on top of all that, 40% of our budget is allocated directly to the states to give away to uh, artists. It's a little bit like, as someone once said, delivering lettuce uh, by rabbit. <laughs> um, you know, little pieces of it get, <laughs> get eaten up along, along the way. What little money we have uh, gets devoured here and there. Um, but um, at least we do have a National Endowment for the Arts. We didn't have one until uh, the, the, really until the uh, Nixon administration. And um, the funding for it has gone up and down, but it's always been, always been very small. Uh, now, that's within the context of other federal support for the arts in other areas. There's the, you know, the, the Smithsonian, the Kennedy Center, uh, uh, et cetera. And of course, what we have uh, here, as we all know, very vibrant uh, private support for the arts, uh, individuals, corporations, uh, foundations, uh, et, et cetera. Uh, but even taking all of that, and we can get into some of the numbers later, uh, taking all of that together, our cultural support of the arts is still a fraction on a per capita basis uh, of what it is uh, in France. I think on a per capita basis it's a, um, 116 euros uh, per, per capita. And if you take all of, all of the arts uh, support in the United States, public and private, at all levels in this country, it's probably about 55 cents per capita. $55. So, I mean, I mean, I'm at $55. $55. $55 versus 100, 116 uh, euros which is $125 or whatever. Right. So um, that's a pretty dramatic difference and I think uh, indicates something that we need to talk about. And I'm sure we will talk about it today about the relative commitments to culture in, the, uh, in, these, uh, in these two countries. Uh, I'll leave it at that for now. I know we're going to get much more into that, into the whys, wherefores, and hows uh, in a minute. Okay. Until now. Let's well, see if this works. Yeah, I don't know. Do you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so it works. Um, yeah, in France, the Minister of Culture is something new, actually. It was created by André Malraux just after World War II, and uh, with two main roles. Uh, the first is to give access to culture to everybody. And when I say everybody, I'm thinking of the remote territories especially. The idea of André Malraux is that every citizen of France could access culture, and that's a very... Uh, important uh, statement of André Malraux. And I think that's the main reason why the Minister of Culture exists. Uh, this minister supports a lot of public theaters, um, public schools, um, public drama schools, more than 40 on the whole territory drama schools, uh, 20 dance schools, 70 national theaters. So it's the idea of uh, engaging every corner of the territory. I think that's the, the first mm -hmm. uh, main role. Um, the, and to that respect, the other uh, idea is to give access to the young people to culture uh, through free uh, entrances to the museums. So that means that the state has to support and to pay for the museums. Uh, we have the student pass, for example, which is an important policy driven by the Minister of Culture. And the idea that every student in, uh, in France can go to many, many, many films, uh, museums, spectacles. So that's the first idea, democratization mm -hmm. of culture and creating a homogeneous network 
throughout the territory. And the second role of the Minister of Culture is to support creativity, to support artists, and to support um, uh, new creations. And that's through different systems. So um, I will go further into details, but just the overview is that uh, the total budget is uh, 13 uh, billion euros, uh, including, but Wait, including taxes, I mean, including uh, uh, tax exemptions. The budget, the federal budget is 7 million euros, so you were right, it's about 9 uh, billion dollars. Um, but, uh, I mean, it includes, for example, uh, the financing of the Louvre, and here you have the Metropolitan Museum, which is private, so it's really different systems. I, I think it's difficult to really compare. It doesn't mean that art or uh, culture has less support in the US than in France. It means that it's considered as a collective and national priority, and therefore that the choices that, ha that, has, that have to be made um, have to be made by the state. Um, which is a really different way of, of thinking. Um, for example, take the CNC, uh, Centre National de la Cinématographie, it's a French agency, 100% owned by the state, uh, that provides support for creating films. Uh, and especially new films, I mean, uh, new director of films. The films they support are uh, out of something like 240 films a year, you have 40% of the films supported which are uh, foreign films, international productions. So it's not a system of only supporting French culture, it's more a system of supporting creation uh, that involves French people, but not only French persons. So um, I would say that this role of the state in culture is not new, whereas the Minister of Culture is new, because it's, it has always been uh, the core of our DNA. And for example, it was, I mean, culture is uh, something every king in France had to deal with. Uh, Louis XIV created the Louvre, he created the Paris Opera Ballet, he created a lot of things, and every French president tends to have a big cultural project. And Mitterrand, obviously, with the Pyramid of the Louvre, or Chirac with the Primarts Museum. So it's a different conception, but I wouldn't say that, uh, obviously, culture has less uh, support in the US. I guess one, one thing you could add to cultural support in the US is the um, tax benefits of um, philanthropy, of, of giving to uh, cultural organizations. Uh, there's a significant, in a sense, federal subsidy for, for doing that. Uh, but even you know, taking that even taking that into consideration, taken all in all, there is less cultural investment in the United States than than in in France and and other European countries. There's n there's no question. But regarding uh, tax, it's an interesting phenomenon because uh, there is a new law. I mean, it's a 2003 law, which uh, gives an enormous advantage to to an enormous uh, tax um, exemption, 60%. I think it's one of the most generous in the world. And still, um, fundraising is re really low, and if you compare France and the US, the, the, we, we, we are really ridiculous. I mean, uh, regarding fundraising, it's something like $500 million a year for culture, which is, I, I don't know the exact numbers in the US, I think it's even impossible to calculate it, but it's really a small amount. But it's changing. Well, about 17 billion. Wow, well, yeah, so that, that's another difference. Uh, but it's changing. For example, the, the Louvre, if you, if you look at the uh, operating budget of the Louvre, right now, 40% of the budget is, um, uh, comes from private support. And even Versailles. Thank you, uh, I was wondering if I should do Oh, that. thank you, I lost my. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you, Pierre. Um, so even Versailles, which is like the emblem of, of, of uh, French state and of the teams and everything, 25% of the, the budget of Versailles is, is 
comes from uh, private support. And by the way, uh, part of an important part of that comes from here, from American friends of, of Versailles. So American friends of Versailles. Yeah. So I, I wanted uh, to dig a little bit deeper into these differences in terms of level of financing and relative roles of the state, but I, I thought it would be first interesting to, um, to underline that your role until now as um, cultural counselor in the United States actually doesn't fall under the Ministry of Culture, so that there's, there's an important effort within France through the Ministry of Culture, but there's also an important effort to promote culture abroad through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So do you want to talk a little bit about your, your role and um, what role the Ministry of Foreign Affairs plays through cultural um, services in embassies and other um, ways abroad? Does anybody know what French cultural services do here? I'm afraid I know the answer. Um, well, surprisingly enough, I, I effectively I represent France, but I work for American people. Mm -hmm. And why? It's because of Paul Claudel. The story is that Paul Claudel was the ambassador to the U.S. in the beginning of the 30s, between the two world wars, and it was, um, I mean, evident that there could be a third, possible second war in Europe. So every European country tried to have more influence with uh, American influential people. And Paul Claudel made two statements. The first one was that if you want to have more influence here with American influential people. Uh, you have to play the card of culture. You have to use culture, given that we are France and that it's, it corresponds to our image. And the second statement is even more important. Uh, the second statement is that American people or institutions are more able to promote French relationship, French American relationships or French culture that any French institution. So he called for the creation of a service here that would help these American, I mean, individuals as well as museums, universities, uh, festivals, whatever, to help them to, to, to foster this link. And with the traditional slow pace of French bureaucracy, uh, it finally got created after World War II, so a bit too late for mm -hmm. the, the initial purpose. Um, by Claude Lévi-Strauss, the ethnologue, right. who is the, the thinker of the otherness, which is not a coincidence, I think. And effectively, as you said, Chani, we work for the Minister of Foreign Affairs. We work a lot with the Minister of Culture and the Minister of Higher Education. Uh, our role is a diplomatic role, diplomatic mission, is to make American and French civil societies closer. And uh, for that, uh, our, our strategy is uh, to develop cultural links, university links, and education links. So, and so just to give the people in the audience uh, um, an idea of the size of the effort in the United States, how many, how many people do you have on the staff of cultural services in the embassy across the United States? Well, it depends what you include, but I would say 80 people. Uh, a third of them is here in New York. New York is the headquarters of the French cultural services. A third is in DC. And uh, the other third is spread in eight other cities in, in the US. 80 people in the United States. The entire staff of the NEA is 170 people. Right. So and um, what about the presence of cultural services, the efforts in this area in other countries? I mean, is that is that typical? Is there, is there no. that big of a staff in other countries? or? No, the U.S. is, is a priority. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And uh, to compare, um, you, you cannot do the, this comparison because uh, we deal also with higher education programs and education programs. So we would have to compare with uh, a National Endowment for the Arts plus Humanities maybe to, to have a uh, correct number. But yes, it's, it's a big effort, especially in times of crisis. Uh, and I just heard today, that's breaking news, that our budget would not be, uh, uh, we wouldn't have a big down, but it's the exception and not the norm. Many, many other cultural services, French cultural services in the world have a seven or a 10 or 15% down this mm -hmm. year because of the financial crisis. So uh, the US is obviously a priority for the French uh, government and I, 
I mean, it's not a surprise. Right. Yeah. I, I think th this you know, raises an interesting question. Uh, when we talk about, you know, we can talk about the, the numbers for, for quite a while, but you, you could make the case, some do, that if uh, we're just funding um, culture in different ways through different means, one's more publicly funded, and one's more, more privately, if the support ends up um, significant in both cases, what's the difference? And I think there's a big difference. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you saw uh, some, of, some of the results of that in the last uh, recession, where suddenly um, private funding uh, dried up virtually overnight, where foundation endowments were suddenly worth uh, 50, 60 percent less, private donors stopped writing checks, and suddenly uh, cultural institutions started going under because being dependent on um, more, a more capricious mm -hmm. system of private philanthropy, uh, there wasn't that kind of steady uh, support that can span uh, a difficult uh, economic economic crisis, and we really saw the uh, the results of that in the last uh, s you know the last uh, recession without um, without a doubt. And um, you know the the other aspect, of course, is what this says you know about the quote public you know values uh, in in a society what it officially decides uh, decides to support. And, um, and, and how, uh, we have this um, uh, ethos in the United States that um, you know, we believe in, the, um, uh, in free enterprise, in the, in the, in, in, uh, you know, we're, we're a, uh, a free enterprise uh, marketplace country, and this is how we uh, support things. The, the, the assumption is, and everybody seems to have this, that if something's worth doing, somebody will pay for it. It'll get done, the, the free market, Mm -hmm. So-called free market will um, will 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 take care of it, and uh, of course, what that means is that what survives is what, off in many cases, um, is is blessed by 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 that system. What what um, uh, people who buy tickets or uh, donors who who make donations decide is the most uh, worthy and and uh, uh, and viable. I think one of the reasons you have an NEA at all that they even exists. Is that so that the marketplace is not the only arbiter of what gets uh, of what gets supported uh, in 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 this in this culture, um, you know? And there, we don't do this in every case. I mean, people don't say, "Well, um, we'll have, we'd have a space program if people decided to buy it, if enough private, you know, people decided to support it, or a, or a public uh, national park system or whatever." But with the arts, there is the um, the notion that if it's worth doing, the private sector will take care of it. It will be done. And not necessarily, and what you have then is uh, a culture and an art uh, that reflects uh, marketplace values. There's a, a, a wonderful book that I've been referring to a lot lately uh, by Michael Sandel uh, called What Money Can't Buy. And he makes the point that, uh, which I think is a very interesting one, he says historically we've always had a marketplace uh, economy, that the marketplace is determined the buying and selling of goods and, and, and the economy that we have. But only in recent decades, very, very recently, historically, have, do we now have a marketplace society where all the values through, throughout the society seem to be determined by the marketplace, by what people will bid, what the bid and ask is on, on, a, on, a, very, on, a, on a certain artistic product. This is a very, very dangerous situation and only exists uh, in this country. It's not that different in healthcare where we have the attitude, well, you know, if, if uh, people want health care, they should be able to buy it. It doesn't have to be publicly funded. Well, that's the situation we have in the arts. And it's, uh, it's very pernicious and, and, um, uh, and, very, and very scary, I think, over time. And how, how, do you, how do you explain that? Do you think that there's less, there's less of a belief in the importance of the art? Do you think it's, it has to do with, with um, a different attitude about the role of the state? Um, is it that art is seen as something that's frivolous and we're utilitarian and we don't see the usefulness of it? It's, what, it's, what, 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 what's behind the relative, relative lack of public funding for the all, arts in the United all, States? All of the above. Uh, it's partly a fundamental, visceral distrust of the arts. Uh, we have this kind of, cow, cow, kind of cowboy mentality where the arts are maybe um, elitist, uh, left wing, a little bit gay, uh, <laughs> that, uh, that the artists are not somehow, you know, the, the arts, the pursuit of the arts is not somehow, uh, you know, um, uh, virile. 
Uh, I mean, we really do have that mm -hmm. prejudice in a lot mm -hmm. of parts of the country, and I've been going around the country uh, seeing a lot. There is, there is that, that I think, that vi visceral distrust of the, trust of the arts, that it's, that it's something elitist. We also have uh, this kind of cowboy mentality in the sense that this is how we should support things, that the marketplace will determine what's, uh, what's valuable and what, what, should be, uh, what should be supported. Um, there, you know, there's the sense that, that, uh, this is, uh, that the arts are something extra. It's an add-on. It's something we don't need that it's not a core uh, necessity like uh, food, shelter, uh, medical care. Although <laughs> medical, medical care, I guess, is questionable. <laughs> Dispensable, um, too, apparently. And, and, of course, you know, I've been you know, going around the country saying that art is a core necessity. Every, every society in the history of the earth, going back as far as we, we can record, has had art, mm -hmm. has had uh, what the rudiments or, or present forms of what we know is, as art, you know, cave paintings, uh, music, uh, theater. Uh, dance, movement. Uh, every society on earth historically has had, has had art. It's as much a universal as any other aspect of our, of our humanity. Yeah, I, I think Rocco is completely right, and that's the core of the difference. And that's what I find fascinating about France and the US. You have two coherent systems that work, and I love both. I mean, I, I, I think that the beauty of the world is that we have both. Um, I think it's related effectively to the image of art, maybe, but don't, not only. Um, if you look at health, you were mentioning public health. I think we have the same difference, actually, for, um, for a French. It's very, very surprising that someone who made it financially, like Bill Gates, has the right to make public choices such as, okay, we're going to cure first AIDS or first cancer. or It's surprising. It's a creative choice, and it's not someone who owns money who has to make this kind of choice. It's uh, the state, because the state reflects uh, the citizen. Of course, you can criticize that, because the state is also bureaucracy, so it's not a perfect system at all. But that's the idea. And for, for an American audience, I think that... You would confirm me, maybe, but it's very uh, surprising on the opposite, uh, and for, especially for Bill Gates, it was surprising. Uh, the idea that um, the state can come and say, oh, you, you got a lot of money, give me a part of that, and I will decide uh, if I give, give it to this hospital or that other hospital. I think it's not legitimate. Mm -hmm. So this difference of legitimacy in public choices, I think is in the DNA of our two countries. And it's not only about arts, but it's true that regarding arts, it's, it's particularly um, strong because we have also this uh, approach called uh, cultural exception, which is very often misunderstood. It, uh, it's very often uh, understood as arrogant because people think that, it's, that France is supposed to be the exception, in cultural exception. It's not. It's not the case. I mean, the, the, the exception is culture. And it's the idea that Rocco just uh, stressed, that culture is not really merchandise as others, and that if you give all the power to the consumers in order to choose who's going to be able to make a movie or not, uh, then you can miss important things. Uh, and I think it's true. Think of uh, Citizen Chain, for example. We all consider that it's a very important movie, very important images in the history of images. And uh, when it was first released, it was really not a, a commercial success. Um, so I think it's, or Van Gogh, I mean, there are so many examples of that. Um, so I think we, we deeply believe effectively that all the power must not go to either the consumer or individual donors. And that's, that's the core. And, yeah. What about, um, uh, coming back to, to your idea of the, giving all the, the decision making to the marketplace, but do you think that um, the nonprofit sector follows the same kind of logic as the marketplace in terms of its support for the arts? Do, do you know, foundations that support art, arts organizations or nonprofit um, institutions that exist to support the arts, do they follow a marketplace logic or is there something else that's neither 
state logic nor uh, private marketplace logic that is a really a driving force in arts in the United States? It, it's a great question. The the whole uh, I'll I'll speak about uh, the field that I know a little bit a little bit about theater. Um, in the '60s and and '70s um, was the period when you really had the birth of, of what, we, what we think of now as the resonant theater movement in this country. The the not for the great not for profit theaters that are all all uh, all across the the country. They were largely funded by the Ford Foundation and the NEA. And the notion then was that we need to create um, a subsidized model that has some protection from the exigencies of the marketplace. That you have a protected environment where artists can take chances, where they can make bold choices, where they can develop and nurture work over time that doesn't necessarily have commercial appeal, that, that isn't necessarily going to be judged immediately by the marketplace, that there'll be a role for certain kinds of art that uh, needs subsidy in order to flourish, in order to be protected. You, you really have a, had a uh, notion that if you have subsidy, you also had protection for a certain kind of artistic work and artistic activity. And that was the case, at, uh, the original case at the, at the founding. Now you have uh, not-for-profit institutions, not-for-profit theaters, essentially doing commercial Broadway producing. You have them all over the country moving shows to New York, uh, theaters like, uh, I probably shouldn't name them, that are in New York that, that produce directly on, on, on Broadway uh, and, and uh, are virtually indistinguishable from, from uh, commercial producing ventures. And the boards and the foundations are all complicit in this, all guilty. The boards want to see their, their theater's productions move to New York where they're mm -hmm. validated by, by Broadway uh, success. They want, to, they want to have shows that earned income is the big mantra now in, in, in the non-for-profit institutions. They all want more and more earned income. That's what the boards look at. That's the marketplace. That's the asses mm -hmm. and the seats. So you, so you tend to do shows that are a little more popular, that are a little, are a little safer that are more likely to transfer, that are more likely to be commercial. So you've abrogated the, in, the entire original impulse of this uh, to begin with. So you have many commercial venturers all through the not-for-profit sector. And the, 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 whole, uh, you know, the whole idea is, is, turned, uh, is turned upside down. So I, I, I don't think that, that just having a, a, a not-for-profit sector per se supported uh, privately uh, is the answer. I think you have to have uh, governmental support as well. Obviously what we need is both. You need a full ecosystem where, where there's support uh, coming uh, from all over. I think it would probably be healthier if our countries moved closer in their systems to what each other has, where there is more individual and private support for, for artistic enterprise uh, in France and more governmental support for, for, for it here. Do, you, do um, either of you think that there are some advantages to the American approach? If you think of the French approach as heavy public investment, um, the, the budget of the Ministry of Culture is about $115 per capita. It's about 213 or, or more than that, 230 euros, so $278 or something if you take local funding into account. In, in the United States, the NEA is about 50 cents. Maybe that's where you got the, that figure. 50 cents is um, invested by the NEA. If you look at all um, giving to the arts from foundations, charities, corporations, and individuals, it's about $55 per person. So the investment is still much more significant in France. But France has a kind of top-down, yes. centralized approach. There's a clear cultural policy defined by the state, and that and that's imposed throughout the country through the through the Ministry of Culture. Whereas the American system is much more decentralized, it's democratic, um, it's distributive. Are there some advantages to, there, to that system? There, there are some advantages. Again, I I can only speak with any knowledge about the theater, but if you compare our system, say the English system, there are some advantages to ours. Uh, Production is much more diffused throughout the whole country and, th and, and in many different places, where in England it tends to be top-down. They support the National Theatre, a few academies, uh, and there tends to be some calcification or some rigidity or some predictability about, about the way uh, shows develop there and are, and are, and are, um, are, are, are brought around. Uh, that doesn't mitigate the larger point that, that support is so much greater, and with greater support there's a potential to do a lot more. Mm -hmm. Well, generally speaking, I think that efficiency in policies comes from um, consensus and long-term consensus. The public policies or the policies that work in France are few. I mean, there are few policies that really have an, an impact. In effect, I would say the family policy has an impact because it's a long-term consensus. 
and the cultural policy has an impact because of that too. So I think it's a good thing for us to have this uh, bipartisan approach of culture um, in, in, and, and, and it, that's what makes uh, possible the fact that there are a lot of uh, public uh, contemporary art collections, for example. If you read, we, we have like uh, one uh, FRAC, we call it FRAC. Uh, it's, a, it's a regional uh, um, contemporary art fund. We have one in every equivalent of state in France. We wouldn't have that uh, without this top-down approach if the state hadn't decided to settle that. And, and it creates results. For example, you have an artist, for example, you take Brulek because there is a Brulek ex exhibition in Chicago right now. He started uh, at, at a frat, at the frat Nord Pacale, which is not the most sexy place in the world, but still he started thanks to that system. So I think there are advantages. Um, but I agree with, with, with Rocco. I think that um, the more uh, uh, favorable to private initiative system that you have here, have, has a lot of advantages too. The problem is to create the possibility of meeting both. It's always right. what's difficult. When I arrived here first, I thought that there was a lot of things uh, we should import. And now I realize that we, we cannot import them separately. Uh, we have to import the whole system or to import some parts, but to make them match with our own system. It's, it's, it's like a graph. I don't know how it's, you say that when you... Um, a graph, graph, right. graph. It doesn't always work. So the, the difficult part is to try to imagine which kind of policy we could import without, I mean, breaking down the whole system. Uh, but definitely the system of, of uh, charities and uh, supported with... I mean, it's, I think it's important that you have the, the, the public effort of National Endowment for the Arts of course, because without that, I think that, they, I do, for my friend, it's very French, of course, but I'm your best supporter, because I think that wouldn't work without it. Um, and I would love to try to create a mix, to help, uh, to give advices in France to create a mixed policy between, between both. Yeah. It needs, it needs to be more mixed. Uh, charitable giving uh, in the United States is 2% um, of gross national product. Um, in France, it's Point one percent. Mm. We we need to be coming together better. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so this brings us to a, a bit of a paradox, which is given the the um, heavy investment in the arts in France and the relatively l smaller investment in the United States. If you look internationally at the influence of the two cultures, uh, France has been historically a very very important um, influence culturally. Um, beginning going back to the 17th century when France was the language of diplomacy, the language spoken by aristocrats throughout Europe. And, but well into the 20th century, France had a very strong role internationally and certainly in the United States in cinema, um, right, you know, fiction, um, all kinds of areas. France has had played a very important role in the United States. But now the balance has sort of shifted in the other direction and American culture is omnipresent, not only in France, but, but throughout the world. And if you look at just a few, few indicators in cinema, for example, um, American films count for about 45% of box office receipts in France. If you look at the top 10 films, they're almost always eight, nine, or 10 of them are American. Throughout the world, that's pretty much the case um, in terms of music, American music, English language music is always on the radio. French television is about 30% American. Um, whereas the United States, despite the trend towards globalization, is still quite resistant to um, cultural forms of expression coming from other countries. I, only about 3% of films shown here are of European origin, and only a fraction of that is from France. In terms of fiction, 3% of books in the United States, published in the United States, are translations. It's only about 1% for fiction. So um, how do you, first of all, is that even an issue that can be addressed through public policy? And um, what are some of the concerns that this raises in France? Antonin, what are some of the cultural policies? You, you alluded earlier to cultural exceptional, exceptionalism, and it might be interesting to explain a little bit what the policy response is in France in terms of attempting to preserve French cinema, 
French TV production, French music, and so forth? Uh, okay, it's a very good question. Uh, it might seem a bit paradoxical, but um, what you mentioned about translation, for example, I think it's an American problem, not a French problem, to be French. In France, uh, one third of novels are translated, translated. translations. Uh, one book over six is a translation. Um, and, and French is a certain, the certain language translated in the world just after English. Mm -hmm. So I think that being international inside is not uh, a problem for creation. Uh, hosting a lot of American culture in France is not a problem for creating French films, for example. As I mentioned, we, the, the, the French system created 240 films last year, which is one film for 250,000 people. And in the, US, in the US, you produce one film for 400,000 people. So we produce more per capita films. And talking of quality, I think you mentioned the fact that, of course, the, the top 10 films in the world are mostly American. But if you look at the festivals, uh, if you look at the 10 last Palme d'Or in Cannes, seven of them are French f productions or co-productions. Mm -hmm. Well, you will say pa Cannes is a French festival, okay. If you look at New, New York Film Festival, <laughs> New York Film Festival. Uh, your, 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 <coughs> I'm sorry, your statistics, statistics are skewed a little bit by considering you know, Die Hard 4 as a cultural ar artifact. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's important. <laughs> Um, yeah, at the New York Film Festival, is uh, one one third this year. Uh, I have the number here. Yeah, uh, on 32 films at the New York Film Festival, 12 were French productions or co-productions, and it's the same one third at the Venice Festival, at the Berlin Festival. So uh, at the main film festivals, one third of the films are French productions or co-productions with other. Um, countries or directors. So I wouldn't say it's a problem, on the contrary. And I wouldn't say that the, the, the efforts made by uh, the government uh, is, is a waste. I think that it's, it, it works. Can you, can you maybe explain a little bit what, what the policies are that, that encourage French cinema, for example, in terms of quotas and subsidies and so forth? Of course. Uh, first, you have, uh, it's absolutely true, a quota on TV channels. Forty percent of the films on TV channels have to be European. I'm s uh, yes, and, uh, and a big part of them have to be uh, in French language. Mm -hmm. Not French, but uh, French speaking. Uh, but that's not the main part of the support. I think that the main part of the support is not a direct support, it's a law. Uh, it's a law that um, states that each time you buy a ticket to go uh, at a movie theater, 11% of your ticket price goes through the CNC, the agency I was mentioning, to the production of new films. <coughs> so each time you buy a ticket, you uh, produce a, new, a part of a new film. And that's an important system, of course, for... Uh, the diversity of, of French cinema and the fact that we are quite active on this on this scene. Um, did I answer your question about uh, exception? It's yeah, quota plus uh, incentive tax incentives plus systems that uh, oh, you have also the Channel Plus system. I was mentioning the channel. Mm -hmm. uh, a big part of their budget has to go to. Uh, Productions, and by the way, it's not French productions. It's productions. A part of them have, has to be French, but not only. I, I think there's a, a maybe noteworthy difference here between what I would call the portable arts and the performing arts. Mm -hmm. A cinema is a portable art. It can be seen by anyone anywhere. It's it's, it's transferable. Um, painting is a is a is a is a portable art. Uh, the performing arts are not. Um, and when, you ha when the arts are portable, there's much more uh, cross-cultural influence. Um, the new wave um, uh, French cinema makers, uh, you know, uh, uh, Godard and, and, and uh, Truffaut and Louis Malle, 
uh, have had a tremendous influence on, on American filmmakers. They, in turn, were influenced by earlier American filmmakers, I mean, the gang gangster films and, and the things that they watched from here. So there's much more cross-pollinization in, in, uh, in those arts than there would be, say, in theater or, or, or ballet or whatever, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what's really interesting. I mean, these these exchanges that create influence and uh, mutual influence. It was amazing last year uh, with the artist. Uh, what you had at the Oscar ceremony was a mutual declaration of love. You had this uh, French movie about American cinema, the artist, and you had uh, the Scorsese film Hugo, mm -hmm. which was a American Declaration of Love to French cinema and to Melies. Mm -hmm. And that these two films were the most highlighted in the Oscars. And it reveals the mutual influence between the two countries. And this is true for cinema, but I think this is true for every, every art, actually. Mm -hmm. And so what about the, the performing arts? How, how much exchange is there um, today between France and the United States in terms of American artists going to France, which has been a long tradition, and, and French artists coming here. I've heard it argued that there's a kind of that French that American artists find so much support in France, um, and in in fields like dance, Trisha Brown, uh, Carol Armitage, in music. We'll hear from George Lewis in a moment. Um, in other performing arts, there, there are many American artists who either move to France or spend some time there and benefit from residencies, um, from commission, do commissioned works that are performed in Europe, but then very often brought back to American audiences at venues like BAM and Lincoln Center and other venues. And I've heard it argued that there's a kind of pipeline where Americans are supported by the subsidies that they receive in France and, and then bring back works that then benefit American audiences. Is this something that, that you think um, is a reality? And if so, is it a good thing? Is it a problem? Is it? There are hundreds of examples. I mean, thank God for France for appreciating American artists more than they're appreciated very much here. I was, uh, George, George will relate to this. Uh, the Bakers, Josephine and Chet, right. um, you know, could work in France and flourish uh, and not, um, you know, not, not so much here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say it's not a problem at all, on the contrary. I mean, it's part of soft power, let's say. But if you take one example, Mers Cunningham. He was discovered in France at the, at the Festival mm -hmm. d'Automne mm -hmm. in 1972, if my memory is good. And uh, then, because of that, he was discovered in Europe. And then he founded his own company here. But he included in his company a lot of French dancers. So in return, mm -hmm. it was important for uh, these exchanges. And now the new director of one of our main center for national center for choreography. Uh, the new appointed director is someone of the uh, Mayor's Training Company. So the story goes on and on with these mutual exchanges. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for the arts. I think that if you are an artist, uh, you should be happy to know that there are these two countries on the planet there is the U.S. and there is France. Are there as many examples of, <laughs> are there, there are very many French artists who come to the United States and who um, flourish here and then re return, or is it more A lot of it, you think, if you think of Michel Gondry, for example, mm -hmm. who makes uh, both uh, blockbusters and experimental mm -hmm. films. He lives in New York, Pierre Huyghe, uh in visual arts lives in New York. I mean, I think that it really works both ways. Mm -hmm. So in just a moment, we're going to have um, George Lewis come up and give a response and then ask a first question, and then there will be time for the, for the audience to ask questions. Um, but I want to ask one last question um, of Rocco, since this is his last public, public appearance, and just ask you to tell us what, um, what you're proudest of in your tenure as, as chairman of the NEA and what you're looking forward to next. Um. To answer the second question first, I, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, I keep getting um, notes from people saying we can't wait for the next act and for the next, uh, you know, really exciting thing. There may not be a really exciting <laughs> thing. <laughs> I may just go into private life and, um, you know, walk on the beach. Which is very exciting. It's very exciting to me <laughs> right. and, very, and very selfish. Um, but um, looking back, I, you know, I wish I had the rest of the evening I could talk about how excited I am about 
what what we've done at the NEA. But the, the big thing I think is to um, bring um, the arts to the table uh, uh, in um, federal policy. That mm -hmm. this is no longer an East Wing um, tangential uh, extra. Uh, icing on the cake phenomenon, that, it, that it's part now of cultural policy. We sit at the Domestic, domestic Policy Council, and we are now integrated uh, as a part of each one of the major federal agencies, the Department of uh, Health and Human Services, Department of uh, Transportation, Department of Education, uh, Housing and Urban Development. We have major initiatives, which I won't go into in detail, with the uh, Defense Department. You know, who knew that there would ever be important partnerships between the NEA and, and the Department of Defense? Um, we are all, we are imbe embedded, to use a military phrase, all across the federal government mm -hmm. now um, in a way we have never been before. And there have always been arts in, 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 um, in each of these agencies in one way or another, but now um, there's a formal relationship and there's ways for um, arts uh, organizations and artists to access funds and support all across the federal government. And arts policy and arts and the engagement with the arts is now uh, part of uh, part of federal policy, and that that I think is new, and I'm very excited about that. Very good. So um, I think we'll ask George to come up now to the podium and give a response, um, and then George is going to talk a little bit first about the time that he spent in France as an artist, and then respond a little bit to what he's heard tonight and ask a first question. Um, and so in the meantime, you can be thinking about your questions. There, there, I believe, will be a microphone set up in the middle aisle, and there is one already, and then there will be handheld mics on the side. So be thinking about your questions, and we'll have um, a chance to hear them in just a moment. George. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Um, is this on? Can I, you, you can hear me. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks to um, the panelists, uh, Shani, for inviting me to this extraordinary event. And, uh, <laughs> Didn't know about the familial connections, but I'm very excited to celebrate those and uh, <laughs> and to thank the Maison Francaise and, and Dean Carol Becker, my old friend and School of the Arts at Columbia, Office of the President's World Leaders Forum. I wanted to add my thanks to the others for sponsoring this really engaging and intriguing colloquy. Um, and also to welcome Antonin Baudry, who, and I wanted to also uh, take a moment to again thank Rocco Landisman for his great service to the NEA as he moves ahead toward ever newer vistas in his long and distinguished career. So I just wanted to thank you for that. When you hear long and distinguished career, it's never good. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's going on. <laughs> About that long engagement with uh, uh, cultural expressive production in France, for me it goes back to, personally, to the uh, mid to late 1970s concert performances in Paris and elsewhere, even before my um, three years of residence doing research in interactive computer music at IRCOM in the early 1980s. Uh, IRCOM is a computer music institute. Uh, in the right in the center of Paris, uh, founded by in the 1970s by the composer and conductor Pierre Boulez at the direct behest of the president of the Republic, Georges Pompidou. And it was been the subject of a highly um, influential and sometimes controversial 1994 ethnography by the British anthropologist Georgina Bourne. Now, IRCOM is certainly the the best funded and arguably the most innovative center for musical research in the world for this kind of musical and performance compositional research. It's, it's the envy of many of its cousins, including our own uh, computer music center at Columbia, which makes up for its decidedly less ardently funded, at least by our administration, that's a shout out to you guys, um, by the dynamism of its incredible faculty, professors Brad Garden, Douglas Rapetto, Terence Pender, and by the incredible students. Now, this, my engagement with French expressive culture is rooted in large measure in a strong relationship between France and African America, which goes back quite a bit further, and as well as the French American staging grounds for the emergence of 20th century black internationalism are particularly well addressed by another one of our faculty members, our own professor of English comparative literature, Brent Hayes Edwards. You might know his award-winning book, The Practice of Diaspora, which documents the extensive cosmopolitan 
relationships in France, in Paris, forged among American, French, French Caribbean, British, and Francophone African literary and political figures of the 1920s to the 1950s, people like Claude McKay, Paulette Nardal, and George Padmore. Uh, as Edward notes, quote, um, the European metropole, that is after the First World War, provided a special sort of vibrant cosmopolitan space for interaction that was available neither in the United States nor in the colonies. Paris is crucial because it allowed boundary crossing, conversations and collaborations that were available nowhere else to the same degree. Okay, well, later, um, uh, my direct musical forebears, the Chicago founders of the Experimental Music Collective, the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians, found a similarly hospitable and cosmopolitan atmosphere practically from the very moment they disembarked in Paris in the spring of 1969 after their week-long transatlantic ship voyage. At the time, Paris had become perhaps the most accommodating city in the world to this newest American experimental music and the unusual hybrids of multi-instrumentalism, humor, silence, found sounds, and homemade instruments, an extended collective improvisation presented by the Art Ensemble of Chicago, Anthony Braxton, Leo Smith, Leroy Jenkins, and others, proved revelatory to French audiences and earned a lasting place in the country's cultural history. So, I took, I was a part of that legacy when I came to Paris in the early 1980s, collaborated with French and European musicians, creating lasting relationships with some of the finest French artists, contrabassist Joël Leandre, and earlier with clarinetist Michel Portal and the percussion quartet Quator Elios. Now today, and we've, all, we've heard this, right? Uh, we've heard this on the panel already. Kind of a widespread piece of conventional wisdom, which is uh, rooted in a bit of truth, among practicing artists on both sides of the Atlantic, that Western Europe in general, and France in particular, is far more welcoming in terms of support than the United States. And in that light, I want to take a moment. It's, it's not going to last long, don't worry. Um, to convey a brief anecdote. You know, I was, uh, for a while here, I was director of the Center for Jazz Studies here at Columbia, and I co-conceived and directed a global festival in 2008. And, you know, I collaborate a lot with international musicians, and I'm pretty aware of the uncertainties foreign musicians face at U.S. ports of entry. And I've also, <laughs> you know, and, and not only musicians, and I've heard it firsthand, as well as from the panelists cons tonight, concerns about the apparent asymmetry of access between our country and others. And that's a factor which you could say is directly at variance with the cosmopolitanism embodied by the contemporary globalized musical landscape. Um, as a result, as festival organizers, we were constantly on edge wondering if the artists we had engaged would actually be able to get into the country. Um, so, and when Mr. Landisman talked about, you know, those changes in the laws, I didn't know there were changes in the laws. I thought they were just changes in policy. You know, I lament that, those laws. I was on an NEA panel many years ago with Eric Bogosian, who was my old friend from the kitchen. And we were just saying, well, what happened to those individual artist grants, you know? I mean, they helped us get started, you know? I mean, I just, I was sitting there in 1975 and I wrote this grant and suddenly, like $15,000 came to me. I thought, wow, this is amazing, you know? All that's gone now. Um, that's all been eliminated, for largely, I think, for political reasons. Um, um, I attended a talk years ago by a French scholar whose research indicated, in fact, that the overall support for contemporary music in Europe and the U.S. was pretty nearly equivalent, but that the difference, as we've heard tonight, concerns asymmetry in public expenditure. And that asymmetry, as also been noted tonight, is mirrored in pretty stark differences in how the arts are regarded in the two countries. Now, again, many artists of my acquaintance have remarked on how various state and media actors in the U.S. have tried to stoke fear and even loathing of artists, as well as disdain for their work. I mean, I remember some of the, my friends, the L.A. Four, you know, Chris O'Feely, Robert Maplethorpe, maybe y'all don't remember that, but I do. And uh, that's well within my living memory. And we've seen freedom of markets wielded as a cudgel against freedom in public culture, while at the same time, economic protections and subsidies routinely accorded to commercial initiatives are touted as somehow inimical to the arts or even handouts, waste, or scams, you know. 
So as a result, musicians of my acquaintance, again, are used to the seasonal runs to Europe. At certain times of the year, New York music takes place in Paris. But, you know, maybe in concluding, I don't want to get too much into that or the vagaries of immigration and customs policy because that's really not our direct remit here. Or, and, I, you know, I don't want to bore you anymore with my comparative anecdotal impressions of art support here and in France. Uh, suffice it to say that, oh, I loved my time at IRCOM, I can tell you that. Um, <laughs> It was extraordinary, and we had our talk here with Pierre Boulez a couple of years ago, also sponsored by Shani and the Maison Francaise, and that was a wonderful way to relive that. And I have to say that being in France helped to produce who I am today. Um, and I'll get into that in a moment, because I'd like to ask us to think a little bit beyond the notion of direct support of expressive production as the primary business of creating cultural infrastructure. Now, you get people like sociologists such as Pierre Bourdieu, Pierre Menguer, Antoine Enion, Howard Becker. They've all shown that infrastructure alone, infrastructure also comprises the production of knowledge about culture. And on the musical side alone, I've been able to forge a lot of significant contacts with eminent anthropologists such as Jean Germain and Patrick Williams at the Ecole des Altitudes or their younger students, Alexander Pierre Pont, who's directed an important series of concerts and museums in Paris. And, you know, my French isn't that great, but I have managed to read the work of scholars like the political scientist E. Citon, who Maison Francaise invited a couple of years ago, the philosopher Christian Bethune, people who have drawn from music in important ways. and. As a faculty member here at Columbia in the areas of music composition, historical musicology, and computer music, my work has really become part of a burgeoning field of critical improvisation studies that really exceeds the aesthetic turn with contributions from researchers and fields seemingly far afield from music, you know, science and technology studies, economics, linguistics, political science, literary theory, neuroscience, and organizational studies. But in fact, all of these fields and others are engaged in interdisciplinary conversation with the arts, and they draw intellectual sustenance from the study of expressive culture. And in that sense, art support becomes a vital link between the arts, the humanities, and the social and natural sciences. That's that's expressed in Christopher Small's notion of musicking. That's a view of musical production that regards all of these actors and many others as embedded in a network along the lines of Bruno Latour that produces knowledge as well as music or directly stated, really, this view frames music as a species of knowledge. So this allows us again to understand the arts, you know, not as that kind of, you know, charming amuse-bouche, you know, that can simply be thrown away at will by governmental actors who are articulating Manichaean oppositions between culture and what are framed as more practical concerns. Um, well, finally, I also feel that the contributions of artists and their products and activities to local, global, and national economies should be far better understood. But I want to submit tonight that just as centrally, expressive culture has become an indispensable node in a network devoted to the exploration of the human condition. And in that sense, to come back to the present moment before we, uh, I wanted to jumpstart a few questions tonight, we can learn much from the French notion of art as public utility along the lines identified by my friend, the musicologist Jan Pazler in her magisterial work on French public culture, Composing the Citizen. In fact, international collaboration between governmental and private entities is crucial to fostering a climate of cosmopolitanism in both our countries that produces not only new kinds of art, but also new kinds of citizens. So that was what I got from listening to you guys. And <laughs> I was sitting here with my iPad typing stuff in, you know. And, 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 and I thought about it a bit before, too, sorry. <laughs> um, but at this point, I sort of want to get the audience involved. I can let you guys involved in a more general discussion of these issues. And, I, and maybe, um, you know, the, where are those microphones? Um, There's one uh, here. Uh, yeah, I, I had a question, but I've talked long enough. Does anyone have a question right now they'd like to pose? Um, come right up and, uh, and address, you can address the panel. Ah, oh, there's someone back there. 
the extraordinary director of Harlem Stage, Patricia Cruz, who I can see right there even with my glasses. Hello. Thank Hi. you. <laughs> Thank you, George. This is an incredible opportunity for me to ask a question, and I will do that. Because I do think that the issue that you've raised, if we are to truly, in the, on the United States side of this equation, be the cosmopolitan place in which art can be, explored, ideas exchanged, we have to be open to that process. And my curiosity, Rocco, and all of us here, is how we might impact the State Department and our nation in terms of allowing artists from all over the world to come to America so we can have that exchange. I ask the question on the eve of what was to have been a seminar, a, a two-day symposia that we were uh, sharing with um, Shawnee and Columbia uh, that has been postponed, uh, as well as two concerts of a performance called Sleep Song which was the result of a collaboration between artists living in France, Mike Ladd and Vijay Iyer here in the States, uh, that had done a production at uh, Royaumont, and we saw it. It was chapter two of Holding It Down that we did. That too has been postponed because once again, George, to your point, the visas were uh, not processed in a timely way, oh even though we started the process many, many, many months ago, and certainly in time to do that. But it was a heartbreaking episode, which meant that we could not hear the Iraqi side of the equation that was about veterans of color in um, the current wars. So again, the question is, what can we do using our combined power to affect a change that allows for a very significant exchange of voices and visions. Thank you. I just want to just to um, underline that the visas in question were for artists who were supposed to be coming from Iraq for this performance at Harlem Stage and a two-day conference. Um, so thank you. That was a that was a great question. And the French Embassy was supporting right. actually the action. So. But Rocco, this is not, we don't mean to be trapping you, because I don't think you even knew about this and it's not really in your, in your domain, but maybe you still have a, a comment or No, I mean, the, the point that Patricia raises is, is an essential one. Uh, exactly the opposite should be happening from, from what is, and, and we seem to be going back into more of a Cold War mentality. The, uh, the world has changed now in the sense that um, the big conflicts, uh, the big world conflicts are not between armies and um, arsenals of, of, of weapons with overwhelming force, the, the issues now are cultural. The conflicts are cultural. So the, um, the way to deal with them are cult is, is cultural. Uh, we have to have more exchange and more cultural um, uh, contact rather than less. Uh, to become xenophobic and to, and to start to pull back and put barriers between us and other cultures is exactly the wrong, uh, the wrong approach to this. And uh, we all have to weigh in with uh, whether it's our elected representatives or people at the State Department or however we can get there to, to make them understand that the, that, that the way for us to prevail, uh, our way of life to prevail, is to, is to be true to who we are, which is open and inclusive and inviting of all cultural voices, uh, not to try to uh, exclude some of them. I, I totally agree. Uh, we have a question here. Do we have a microphone? Uh, maybe yeah. there's a microphone back there. Or you could bring her a microphone. Thank you. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Um, my name is Jacqueline Spann, and I deal with Africa. And, uh, and I've traveled extensively in Europe and Africa, and I see American art everywhere. And no one in America seems to know that it's happening or how wonderful it is. And the same goes for Europe and Africa with their art coming here. Um, you know, you look at SIPA and you see all of these different nationalities that have artistic and cultural uh, talent. And I've never seen it exhibited anywhere 
here in the lobby or anywhere. And uh, don't forget about the fashion industry, which is a trillion dollar industry. And every nationality has fashion. So I'm just saying that it could contribute more to the GDP if um, you know we realize, if we sat down and figured out a way to gain the knowledge of the the Americans and the world that are doing fantastic work and acknowledge them and also the exchange with the other nationalities and their work and it doesn't have to all be about war and the harshness of things there's so much beauty and you know what would happen to to us as a people if we did not have art? You have to think about that. That's very serious, very important. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, George earlier alluded, it, as, as you did, to, uh, you know, fashion is a trillion dollar industry. George talked about the, the power of the arts uh, economically. This is something we've tried very hard to, to, to emphasize. Uh, we just uh, have been successful recently, and I'm very proud of this too, of getting the Bureau of Economic Analysis, the BEA, which keeps track, essentially keeps track of um, uh, GDP, gross domestic product, to include the arts as one of the things that they measure. Uh, they measure, you know, travel, tourism, manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera. But there are, there are five million arts-related jobs in this country. The arts are a big part of, of the economy of this country and should be measured, measured as such and kept track with uh, as, as such. And that's you know beginning beginning to happen now. This obsession we have with manufacturing. Well, you know, arts are manufactured. Uh, uh, artists are manufacturers. Someone has an idea, writes something on a piece of paper, a play gets done, a a, a painting gets created, uh, that becomes part of the economy. That's something that is that enters the realm of economic activity. The artists make things, they manufacture things, and that has to be counted. We need to start counting that. We have two questions from you, and then you th you have a question. Alternative, okay, you have great. A response? Well, thank you. Uh, yeah. Oh, you have a, uh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Just, no, just a word because I totally agree with uh, Rocco. Uh, I think that you're right. And in France, we have a lot of policies to support African arts, but not especially fashion. And maybe we should think about it because fashion is, is not considered as part of this cultural exception that you mentioned, Chani. But uh, I think we should think about it, and you're right. Yeah. Please. Um. Hi, my name is Margot Viscusi, and I've been on a number of boards of arts organizations. And I think it's very hard for a European to understand the amount of time and energy and expense that goes into fundraising uh, on the part of the staffs of art organizations in this country. On the other hand, I have heard it said that, or I even think to some extent myself, that, er that if you have to sell what you're doing to donors every day, you do formulate those, you formulate very well and in a dynamic sense the idea of what it is, what your mission is, what, what you're about. Or, or. On the other hand, I've never understood in a state where the, uh, in, a, in a country where the state funds to a great extent um, the arts, what is the energy, the time, the thinking that has to go into, on, say, on the part of a, uh, a regional theater company? Do they have to lobby for their budget? Do they have to explain their budget? And how often do they have to do that? And who does it depend on how you get funded and to what extent? You're totally right. And it's difficult for French to uh, understand what fundraising means. And I, I must confess that I had to learn it quickly when I arrived here. Uh, actually, this, this year in 2012, thanks to the cultural services team, we, we raised $12 million, which is an absolute uh, record here for uh, as long as the cultural services exist, I think. Uh, so I, I know how difficult it is, how much time it takes, and, uh, and this is part of American culture. And this is not part of French culture, I, effectively. Uh, which is part of French culture is uh, to try, yes, to advocate and to try to explain uh, how you would invest the money that the state would give you and to try to explain them for each euro uh, what you would do uh, with it. And there is a, a recent law in France uh, that changed everything. It's called the LOLF, 
it's, um, it states that you have to justify each euro of your budget. Before this law, you just had to justify the changes uh, before uh, the former year, uh, between the former year and, and the, actual, the current year. And it changed everything. And I think that we go closer and closer to the same approach of uh, explaining what you're doing, explaining why it's, it, it, can, it could have an impact, and uh, why, you, why you should be funded for that. And when you, uh, when you run a, a, a national center for theater, for example, I think that's the example you, you were mentioning, each year you have to, uh, yes, to lobby for your budget and to explain uh, what you did last year and what you want to do this year. I mean, it's very similar. It's not the same codes, it's not the same um, I mean, it's more on tracks somehow. You won't have a, the possibility to have uh, to go from what, what we did here was uh, with fundraising was basically we were raising uh, half a million dollar a year, basically some years more, some less, some years later. We we went to twelve million dollars. You wouldn't do that with the public funding, of course. So it's more open with a fundraising system, but it's kind of the same approach. May I also remark just in that light that um, I think that governments have been cutting back on the arts in certain ways. I don't know what the French situation is. I know in the Netherlands, where I also lived for several years, um, several of the people, organizations I've been associated with have reached out to me and others to write letters in support of their applications for renewed funding along the lines you suggest. And sometimes these applications have been successful and other, other times not. But I, I do recognize that mode of, um, of how, how money is addressed and raised in the arts in these kinds of social democratic countries. For example, in Holland, I think they have something called the Kunstplan, or the, the Arts Plan. And the Kunstplan is a national and regional um, effort to decide which of the arts organizations um, are um, eligible for subsidy and what kinds of subsidy uh, they're going to receive. So there's an overall sort of global budget and people within that sort of contest for what they're doing. It sounds similar to what you've described. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question here and we have time for a couple more questions, please. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Chance Lennisman. I'm Shani's son and Rocco's nephew. Um, and, well, this might not be as sophisticated as the other questions, but I was wondering if where the majority of the money goes for funding, does it go to individual artists or directors or, like, schools? Um, where where the chunk of the money goes? It goes generally to arts organizations that then re-grant the money to to the artist uh, subsequently. Uh, it doesn't go directly to the artist. It used to, uh, but Congress, as George was talking about before, Congress changed the law so that we can't give money to uh, artists directly. This was a product of the famous um, Maplethorpe years um, at mm. the NEA where there was an uproar about um, some paintings that the NEA, actually wasn't, that wasn't even a direct grant to an individual artist, but um, there had been NEA support of a museum who, who which showed a, um, uh, a controversial Maplethorpe painting, and then Congress got into the uh, into action and, and changed the law. Late eighties, early nineties. Late eighties, early nineties. Thank you. Um, we have time for um, yes, you, and then thanks. <laughs> Hello, thank you very much Good. for some very interesting points. And my name is Michael Chan. I'm from Austria. I'm a student, a student at the School of the Arts in the theater program. Um, so coming from Austria, my cultural DNA is probably more on the French side, but I've now spent a good couple of years in the American system. Um, and I'm wondering, we've heard about arts cuts in, in Europe, governments cutting back on art support. We've heard about the great opportunities for American artists going to Europe um, over the last century or probably longer than that. Um, I, I guess the other side of the medal would be that European arts institutions increasingly look towards American private philanthropists for support, um, which is something that American artists don't like to see very much. I was wondering about your opinion on that, whether that is an opportunity for European organizations, whether that is something, your opinions on, on 
European festivals, and it's, this is not particular to France. You mentioned the Friends of Versailles, but I know the Royal Shakespeare Company in London is doing the same thing, festivals in, Sal in Austria, Salzburg Festival, I'm sure X is doing the same things, looking towards um, their friends in America for support. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, it's right that there has been a, that there is a crisis, and uh, cultural budgets uh, have a down. It's a three percent down for the budget of the Minister of Ministry of Culture in France, which is the first time in history since its creation that there is a down. So it's so it's so it's it's important. But this number of three percent is not as important as many other European countries, and in Portugal, the Ministry of uh, Culture closed completely, for example. Uh, so I think that there is no um, brittle change right now uh, regarding financi financing of culture in France. Uh, but there is the discovery that uh, trying to, f to raise funds uh, can give you more opportunities. So I think that there is a momentum now, and a lot of uh, French cl French institutions realize that there is a momentum now for uh, um, trying to to make more fundraising. But I think the, once again the cultures are really different. I remember we had here the visit of the former minister of research, higher education and research here, Valérie Pécresse. And she heard, she had heard that at Colombia there was a lot of fundraising. And uh, mm -hmm. she wanted to meet the, the, the persons in, in charge of fundraising. And, uh, and, and uh, Shani and uh, her colleagues organized that. And, and she said, I, I wouldn't, I'd like to meet the whole team. And I had to <laughs> tell her, okay, they have 500 people. <laughs> and, uh, so it was a shock. Because uh, she thought that French universities were uh, trying to organize, this, organize the same way of thinking by hiring one or two people. <laughs> so there is a big difference, and I, I think that the gap will always remain, which doesn't mean that we cannot go in this direction, and I think it, it's, a, it's a fantastic idea. Interesting that, you're, that you've gotten a decrease. We've actually, we're actually slated in the 2013 budget from the administration for an increase. I don't know too many federal agencies. Right. Right. We're, we're going to intersect in the year 4040 uh, <laughs> uh, at, this, uh, at this rate. But what's interesting about our increase is that all of it in its, in its entirety is, is, I use the word in quotes, earmarked uh, for a special program we have at the NEA, which is called uh, Our Town. And it's, when you asked me what I was proud of, I could have mentioned this just as easily. Uh, but Our Town is a new program at the NEA that has to do with what I think of as art in the public square, the intersection of the arts and people's real lives, and how arts can transform neighborhoods and communities and revitalize places. And the art can be a very big part of economic revitalization and renewal. And that's what the Our Town uh, initiative is. And that's actually uh, being, um, being funded by the federal government uh, with additional funds now. And I'm very happy about that. Before we take a final question, I just wanted to respond a little bit to your, your issue about um, a private foundation in the U.S. For example, the Doris Duke uh, Charitable Foundation is one of the co-sponsors of the French American Cultural Exchange Program, which supports uh, binational uh, transfers of artists between the two countries. So if French artists come to the U.S. and uh, American artists go to France. And that seems to be something that we'll, we'll see increasingly a lot more of. It's an artifact of the increasing globalization of the, of the cultural landscape. Um, I just wanted to point to one last person, and we may have to start wrapping it up, and I see um, there he is. Do you have a mic? Yes, I do. Great. Um, this has been a very exciting and also engaging evening. Uh, one of the things that I haven't heard enough about is, and I'll, just, I'll, I'll put it this way, uh, things are always changing, the world is always changing, art is always changing, culture is always changing. Now, if that premise is true, I haven't heard enough about how technology is forcing us to change our perception of what art is and so forth. 
And it's very interesting because when you look at things, when you take the reality is that movies are now more prevalent and more important than books. And also, uh, I just heard today on NPR that as kids are now graduating, the push is to force them to read more nonfiction rather than fiction. So all those things are very, very true. And also, uh, people that I deal with, I sort of find kids reacting more to video games rather than reading. So if we can talk a bit more about just technology and how technology is forcing us to change our views of exactly what art is, I'd, I would really appreciate that. Thanks very much. Well, there, there's no question that one of the things we have to do at the NEA is to start measuring this. We, we have a lot of data and statistics that shows that arts participation, the way we've traditionally measured it, has been declining. Attendance in museums, at theaters, at ballets, operas, and, and so forth, has been uh, on a pretty steady downward slope. But if you start to include access to many of those things uh, on the internet or through digital uh, technology and devices, you get a completely uh, different picture. And the ease with which per performers can, uh, and, and events can be created um, digitally without, uh, even, you know, without even necessarily in front of an audience, um, that's very significant. And we need to find ways to keep, uh, keep track of that. There's a whole new world that we have to start um, embracing and being aware of. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, I, I think that technology changes a lot of things. I mean, not only art, everything, the way we interact with the world. Uh, but um, I think that it shouldn't change the contents. I mean, when you read Hummer, you read Hummer, whether it is on, the, on an iPad or on a, on a paper book, and it shouldn't change either um, some of the access to art that the citizen can have. I'm thinking, for example, of bookshops. Uh, if we don't want in France, as everywhere where else, I think all the bookshops to close, uh, I think we have to protect them a bit. That's the, there is a law in France, actually, which is the uh, prix unique. It, it states that there is a single price for each book, so that the big bookshops cannot pressure uh, too much the small ones. And I think it's important. I mean, I don't say that, I, I love my gadgets, I love, I have an iPhone, an iPad, a Blackberry, uh, all of that. I love video games, I'm a big fan, but uh, I think books are important too. Well, I think we're going to have to uh, wrap it up for now, and uh, thank you, thanks to all of you for coming, and please thank our panelists. <laughs>